All right, chat. Uh, we are close to a backup solution for our streaming problem, uh, for which we apologize. Obviously, not what we wanted. Uh, but uh, while we are waiting for the tech guys to sort everything out, uh, we decided we can do a live AMA. So ask us questions, and we'll answer your questions until they have figured it out. So that gives you like five minutes of exclusive access to us in terms of uh, ask us anything. Anything. <laughs> anything. All right. Now we have to wait for the delay on the stream. And how many voices in total in the game? Uh, I assume that there's a question about player voices. So there's eight in total. Uh, if it's a question about how much voice lines we have in the game, it's ah. a, somebody's going to have to watch that chat. And now it's going way too fast. Uh, uh, we're going to have. Uh, yes, I think, no, yes, 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 uh, no. Uh, 100. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I think it's close to 190,000 lines recorded. No, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's something I mean, like I, that. I had the numbers in my head at some point. Uh, we killed our producer, so I don't know anymore. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Beginning of stream. Uh, it's worth putting that in context, actually, also, because we saw uh, once we announced that we had like, uh, what was it, uh, two and a half times uh, full episodes of Game of Thrones in terms of content uh, combined. Um, everybody assumed that you're just going to be watching like hours and hours of cinematics, but that's not true. It's just because there's so much choice and consequence and permutations in the game. It's very hard to transmit that on a stream like this. You'll find out for yourselves when you're going to be playing the game. But there's really a lot of possible stories to be had in uh, Baldur's Gate 3. All right. Uh, what else do we have there? I can't see. The, they're going too fast. I can't read them. So if they don't... All right. Um, can we? Will we? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, does anyone here have a question? Really? Yeah. yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. You got a mic. Sorry, right. chat. You, there's too many of you, and you're too um, fast. I'm sorry in advance because it's a terrible question, but it's a question you will have a lot of things to say about. So maybe it will help for the for the technical problem. Uh, so. Um, Everything is political, even if gamers don't like that. And so with almost two uh, 200 hours of cinematic, you have written a lot of stories. And I was wondering, in the end, when you take a step back and look at every story you told in your game, uh, what are the principal themes? <laughs> Themes, sorry, the morals. Uh, what is the, um, the story you wanted to tell to people? What is the, the final uh, message you, you, we have to take away from the game? All right, we can do. You want me to do it? I can do, do it. it. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, uh, yeah. So, um, first of all, I don't think it's a story we're telling to you. It's a story we're telling with you. Uh, that's really how we think of it. Um, there's there's so many stories in this game. Um, some of them are incredibly dark, some of them are incredibly light, as I've already said. Some of them are funny, some of them are sad. Um, thematically, one of our cores is trust. Um, it's You're thinking about who you can trust, why you can trust them, and why the world should trust you sometimes as well. Uh, and you can be somebody who is incredibly distrustful, and you can go fully down that path. You can be the most noble, virtuous person in the world. Uh, we let you do any of those things. Uh, but it is a collaborative story. Uh, you start playing the game, you're telling the story. Uh, we have our stories, you are going to interpret them, you're going to make your own versions of them. Uh, our message, I mean, for me, it's have fun. Uh, I agree. And there's, a, there's actually there's two axes of team. Uh, this is what Adam just tr uh, said, trust. That's about the party, gathering your fellows. Will they trust you, won't they trust you? But there's also a, a, a vertical axis, which is the one that propels you forward. Got the monster that is growing inside of me. What am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with the fact that this monster is certainly starting to give me powers? Am I going to embrace them? Am I going to resist them? How far will I go with this? This game is going to go very, very far in offering you powers, and it will be up to you what you do with it. By the time you are in Baldur's Gate at the end of, uh, of the game, you're going to be exploring the city, you will arrive there as somebody who used to be a wretch destined to become a monster, and now you are the last hope of the city. But you could be the last hope in a bad way or in a good way. You could say, this is the city is mine for the taking, or this is the city I'm going to save, and I'm ready to sacrifice everything for it. And so uh, those two things you will find back in every single thing, going from the origin stories. Each origin story is about, what do I do? Do I resist the evil inside of me, or am I going to embrace it? And it's also about, like, things have happened to me in the, in the past that caused me to distrust people. How am I going to deal with it? Will I trust somebody again? 
And then the player can obviously be the one that betrays it or goes for it. And like this, you get a lot of storytelling that's, that's, that's coming forth from it. So that's basically the core of BG3 and what we've always relied on as we were developing these hundreds of stories, thousands of stories, really. Yeah. Did that answer it? All right, go ahead. There's more questions in the audience. Go ahead. Thank you very much for this fantastic panel. Before the questions, I'd just like to give a huge shout out to Twitch chat. We've got you on our phones, and we're trying to answer as many questions as we can for you. <laughs> My name's Josh. I'm a massive fan of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. I have been since I was a kid. I've played the games my entire life, and the name is legendary. The stories are mythical, and Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 are some of the most respected RPGs of all time. Why do you think Baldur's Gate 3 is a worthy successor to this title? Okay, uh, I have many reasons. Uh, so uh, we can just uh, break them down one by one. Uh, so obviously times have moved on. Uh, we are 2023. Uh, I think the first Baldur's Gate was in 98, if I'm not mistaken. So um, back in the days, Baldur's Gate uh, 1 uh, embodied everything that Dungeons and Dragons was. It was the first game that really allowed you to play D&D &D in a video game. Uh, it um, had multiplayer, which was very advanced for its time already. Uh, it had a party that you were growing, definitely in Baldur's Gate 2. That was really a, uh, a, a really big innovative step back in the days. Uh, we've done the same thing, but with 5th uh, edition. Uh, we've taken all of the concepts that were pioneered there to a much further extent. Uh, the relationship building that you're going to be doing uh, inside of the game, the party that you're going to gather, that has, uh, you will find out when you're going to play, that has lots and lots more than what was possible back in the days, both in the fact that it's being told to you in a cinematic way, but not in just a linear cinematic way, but actually in a fully dynamic cinematic way that depends and reacts to all of the choices that you've made, all of the decisions that you've been making. And so that is, for me, was one of the core things that we wanted to put in a game that was about gather your party, which is what the catchphrase was of the original uh, Baldur's Gate. Uh, the second thing is uh, this game follows the structure of the original game. You start your adventure elsewhere, there's a big strong call to action, and that takes you to the city. So we are basically following that same journey. You're going to have a strong call to action, which in this case is I'm a, a, about to become a monster, and if I embrace that becoming a monster, I'm going to be a very powerful monster. I was back in the days, you were a ball spawn, and that was the same thing. I have this Lord of Murder that is guiding me, so I need to deal with that. What am I going to do with this? You could turn into the Slayer or not, and these were things that you were going to be uh, interacting with. So there is uh, that aspect. Back in the days, Baldur's Gate 1 uh, was at the peak of what was possible visually. It was a beautiful world. It had a lot of adventure, lots of exploration to be had. You've been trying it out today. I don't know what your thoughts were, but the BG3 offers you the same things. It gives you plenty of adventure. It gives you plenty of opportunities, but it does more. Uh, what was not possible in the days were all of the systemic interactions that we put in there. In that sense, it goes further than what you had, to, and it should because it has to innovate. Uh, BG1 was an incredible innovative game. BG2 was an even more innovative game. I think BG3 is at the peak of what's possible in traditional and actual modern RPGs also. It brings you a game that marries systemics in which you're really, really free. It marries... Um, Everything that's about exploration, adventuring, everything that's been done in the genre, it's all present there. It marries storytelling in a narrative manner that reacts to the system, to the choices that it makes. It's a game that respects your identity in ways you cannot even imagine when you start playing, that you realize as you're going uh, through it. And you can do it on your own or with a friend and multiplayer. And so all those things together, I think, puts BG3 at the forefront of our RPGs, just like its predecessor back in the days. So, and maybe, and most importantly, when it comes to uh, BG3, I think it's a game uh, that is an incredible lot of fun, just like the original games were. And it's going to give you a lot of replay value, and you're going to keep on replaying, you're going to keep on finding new things, and those things, uh, are, are, they're very hard to find in this type of game. And so, those for me uh, make it a worthy successor. Uh, so, in the, uh, it modernizes uh, Dungeons and Dragons in a video game, puts it back at the forefront of where it belongs to be, allows you to play it in any way you want, be anybody that you want, and then actually get rewarded by true AAA cinematic storytelling at a scale that I don't think has actually been done. And you can do it with your friends. You can be watching in split screen two cinematics at the same time with different choices, deal with the consequences of what your friends have been doing. It's just really, really cool. Anyway, that was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
We had, I see the tech guys are still busy, so we continue our, our representation of Twitch now in the audience. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, uh, with all this in mind, how hard is it going to be to pick your party members, your companions? You have been saying how many choices we have. Do we have to stick with them? Can we swap them on the go? Do we get punished for swapping them on the go? What about the ones that come later in the game? Mm -hmm. So, if you, if you yeah. can... Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'll let you do it. I just talked a lot. Yeah, so um, <laughs> uh, they, they can come with you, so is the short answer. Uh, we're not going to lock them out at a certain point. We're not going to say, hey, you've reached the city, you need to leave these people behind. Uh, they come with you, they stay at your camp. Uh, you can pull them out of camp and take them to do things in the city uh, or elsewhere. Uh, you can put them back into camp. They won't always stay, uh, but if they leave, it's because of something you did. Um, it's because you annoyed them, uh, you killed them, you, know, um, you were <laughs> going away, you were not listening to them, you weren't doing the things they wanted you to do. Um, so there are points where they'll leave, but there are narrative reasons that they leave. Uh, they're not, they don't just, there's not a cutoff point for them. So some of them will be very insistent about the things they need to do in the world. It's, it's based on their personality. Uh, some of them are much more open. Some of them, they want to get to Baldur's Gate anyway, so that's where you're going, so they're going to come with you. There are some that, only two actually, that are, don't end up in the same party. Modders will make them in the same party very quickly. Um, and that's for narrative reasons as well. But otherwise, yeah, uh, the ones you find later in the game, uh, they, join, they join your camp. Uh, you can swap them in, you can swap them out. All right, okay. Good. How are we doing? I see games that have booted up. Does that mean that our tech problems are solved? Okay. okay. 59, I think, is this. No. Two minutes, three minutes. All right, it's time for more, some more questions then. Yes, chat. Okay, you uh, know. <laughs> me or chat? <laughs> you. Okay, um, so you, you talked a lot about um, character customization and how much you care about like, the story that the player wants to tell being told or like telling their story, allowing them to experience that and uh, especially about respecting the player's identity that they choose for themselves in the game. And I just wanted to ask what your favorite part about that is, because I, like we had the wonderful opportunity to test it a bit as well, and you, ha you implemented so many different things, and I'm just curious which your favorite part is. <laughs> it's a really simple answer. It's always the latest one that's, that's implemented, so... Uh, right now, I love being a Dragonborn. I mean, like, I really dig being a Dragonborn. Uh, I haven't done a full playthrough as an orc yet, so I think I'm going to dig that too. Uh, so it's really... Um, my, I, my, my systemic developer's heart starts ticking, uh, and the entire team knows that because I get very excited about it, is whenever I get reactivity to having made a choice at character creation, and whenever I get reactivity, whenever I get a, 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 to a choice that I didn't expect the game to react to. And so uh, when I was uh, walking around as a gift druid, I was super excited because I had so much stuff, so much stuff. Like I called them out and said, like, guys, this is so fantastic. Like I didn't know you went this far. So that is really the bit, uh, the reactivity that you get to your class and to your, where you come from. And those are the things that are, are probably the, my favorite bits uh, at this point. Go more. Go ahead. Uh, so you've shown us a lot of, a lot of very horrible things today <laughs> and uh, in the past day. And because we're all bad people, we laugh at that. But we know from gaming that surprisingly people are good at heart, mostly. Yeah. Like from Mass Effect, they all play Paragon. So what are you doing to actually make not just the dark urge, but also the player feel the temptation to give in to evil and be as horrible as you people apparently are? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we give, okay, we are uh, giving you, uh, we're tempting you. Uh, there's a lot of temptation. It's probably another team in the game uh, would be temptation. There's a lot of temptation. You get all these superpowers if you're going to start embracing what the illifit inside of you is. And you can go very far in this, right? So you can go really, really far in that. So if you embrace it, it comes at a price. Price can be horrible. Price probably means that you don't have any friends. Um, price could be even mean. Well, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna not gonna reveal this just yet. Uh, so there are. It's temptation. 
It's literally, but that's what power is. Power corrupts. Why? Because it's so tempting, right? And then once you have it, you never want to give it up again. And because you don't want to give it up again, that's where the corruption begins because there's things that might nag at it. And so that is present in here also. So the, the, the lure of power is a thing that's going to drag you into the evil side. Or not. I mean, and it's not because you resist uh, these things that you're not going to get power, but you're going to get it in a different way. You're going to get friends. You're going to end up with an entire army of allies that's going to be helping you when you're going to have to deal with the final evils. And that's going to be a different experience than if you walk there all alone, very powerful, but with no friends left, because you killed them all. Uh, so, or you, you manipulated them, or you did other things to them. So it's really up to you. Um, I think we're sorted out, Crystal. I think he can give it another go. I All think right. we have frame rate back. Uh, thank you, tech team. Uh.